Uh, I hope you heard that. I was saving it for this video. Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today I wanted to read you some poetry. I thought that'd make for a good video. Something that'd take up an hour or so of my time. Hmm. Hmm. I've been drinking a lot this evening. And I figured, what better time to read poetry than when my, uh... Ego? is so far out on my sleeve. I don't know. Not sure the type of words that I could use to describe how I'm feeling right now, but I figure, hey, this is, this would be a pretty good time to convey to you in true emotion. The emotion I feel in my writing. And all that bullshit. So, without further ado, I'd like to begin. This first poem is something that I read at a poetry reading for this college once, and I read it again at a friend's party, and there's actually a funny story to go along with this poem. So I'm just going to read you the poem, and then afterwards I'll tell you the, the funny-ish shit that came along with it. The first poem here is called... Oh no, my bad, that's the wrong poem. Moonlight Vacancy, my bad. The second poem is the story that has the shit. Uh, okay, then I'll just read you this first poem and get this out of the way. It's called Moonlight Vacancy. The jazz is optimistic, but I listen to it under deaf ears. Ears that have listened too long to the lies and the moans of those aching for more. For wealth, for stability, for the end. They cry every day and never get their way. Then there are the fortunate, who cry for what they do not have. They are cats atop a fence, and they don't let me sleep at night. I am a house cat. No, maybe not a cat. A mouse. A fat, lazy mouse who's too afraid to come out from the wall. When cheese falls, I scurry out and catch it. Then race what I can grab back to my hole to be swallowed whole. Then I starve again, and I go to bed listening to the rich cats and the poor cats and wondering how I got so lucky. That was Moonlight Vacancy. Now this next story I told in front of two different groups of people, and the two of them believed that the contents of the story, which are fictionalized, actually happened, and then uh, felt very sorry for me. Um, <laughs> I mean, the subject matter isn't funny, but the context of what happened afterwards was kind of funny, so I guess, yeah. This next one is Morning Rain. Morning as in, you know, oh, morning. When I was a child, my mother used to tell me that whenever it rained, that meant the angels were crying in heaven. I asked her what could make angels cry, and she used to say it was all the bad things good people did, and for the souls of those who are called to heaven too soon. As I got older, I learned about the water cycle and the purpose of water on earth as explained by science. But in the week following my mother's death, in the long afternoons I spent standing over her grave, I noticed it had rained more than it ever had before. In that moment, I'd forgotten all about the sciences and about the water cycle. For the first time in a long time, I believed in the angels my mother used to speak of. And in my heart, I believed they were crying for her. Now, I told that story, or that poem, twice. And both times, there were inevitably middle-aged women in the audience going, oh. And then, the first time, my friend John, who's also a writer, he, he goes, Wow! That'd be really... That, that'd touch me a lot if I didn't just talk to your mother yesterday. And then, of course, inevitably, the middle-aged women 
you know, wheezing and snarling in the audience went, <gasps> and it was, I found that, I don't know, I found that funny, how, how much middle-aged people just really feed off of emotional material. It's fucking, mm. it's bad, but it's, I don't know, it's kind of funny to me. Mm. This next poem, it's my third poem in my book, Beatnik, which I don't fucking know if it'll ever be released. <laughs> let's let's uh, let, let's pray. Let's hope. This third poem in here is called "Hate, Comma, Be a Friend." I can't seem to find the words to describe hate. It is something primal, something basic. It is neither complicated nor complex. In some cases, it is incapable of being understood, and is therefore unknowable if not personally experienced. Future, oh, future, fuck me, you can tell, hmm. Get straight. Fury is a child, fury, it's the word. Fury is a child of passion and the cousin of humiliation. Humility is the bastard son of humiliation who takes more after its mother understanding. Even still, hatred is the brother of anger and fury, and together they live beneath mountains of patience. And when the word spitefully calls down thunder, and when the world spitefully calls down thunder, wakes up the brothers three and brings forth their wrath, everyone wonders why, but can't find the reason. Sorry, that one's a little fucked up. This is my last glass of whiskey for the night. I swear to God. After that, I'm putting this bad boy away. By the way, for anyone who's ever uh, thought about trying whiskey, but regular whiskey burns you too much, Crown uh, Royal Apple. Fucking delish. It's definitely going to be one of my go-tos now. Aside from uh, Rex Goliath wine. Definitely good. Very good. Delicious. Mm. Especially on ice. Mm. Sweet. Doesn't burn as much. Next story. Next poem. Uh, it's called Fire Treasure. And it is about... Uh, I don't really know what it's about. I remember I wrote it a fucking while back. But Fire Treasure, I got the name because when I was writing it, I was thinking of this song from uh, Lupin the Third, The Castle of Cagliostro. I love the theme to that movie. It's fucking beautiful to me. I have no idea what the fuck the Japanese singers sing it, but the song is beautiful. And while I was writing this, I was kind of writing about my feelings on the the artsy shit of the film while I was um, doing this and the name of the song is like something Fire Treasure so I'm like it's a perfect name for this poem Fire Treasure so there we go this is Fire Treasure at first the warm air hit me and then the blue sky then the green plains at once in my mind I heard violins and then the passing of smooth drums the xylophone bounced with the beat of the sun, yet I felt no updraft. The day, excuse me, the day was singing a tune, as in the distance the sea pulled on and off the sand. It was a rhythm I was used to, and one I had waited a while to hear. It was only in this place, at this time, that I could hear it, and away into the music I went. That was Fire Treasure. This next story is called The Pass Around. I don't know why I keep calling them stories. They're poems. Oh. Mm. Poems that convey stories in a way since that's what I try to get across. This is The Pass Around. When I was young, I used to think adults had mean built into them. It's mean as in like, 
meanness. It wasn't until I grew up and got my mean card that I found out it was mandatory. You had to carry it around with you and show your mean to those who called you out on not having it. I saw the mean of plenty of other people, even when I didn't want to. In time, I accepted the mean and figured out you couldn't throw it away. So, as you grow, remember well, and especially on the day they give you your mean card, it'd probably be best to just throw it away. That was uh, the pass around. That was, that was actually that was that was. I don't know. I don't care. I don't know about you guys, but that was a better poem than I remember it being. Mm. Mm. This next poem is based on a true story. True, true story. It's called Robins in Passing. I always used to think that red robins were immortal, you know? I used to think they were majestic, untamable, and wise. Then one day, I was walking down this side street, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw one lying there, dead in the sand for maybe an hour. Its beautiful red feathers hadn't faded in color, and it was the closest I had ever gotten to a robin to appreciate how orange its beak was. Best I could figure it, the little guy had gotten hit by a car and went flying on impact. I remember always seeing birds dive in front of cars right before they raced by and thinking these daredevil avians must sit on the sidewalks, bedding worms and seeds that they could fly across the road without getting hit. Maybe this robin was one of those. I bowed my head to the carcass and kept walking. Five minutes later I happened upon the freshly deceased remains of an American robin. Its feet were scrunched up as if it was clawing out to reach something in its final moments. Its colors were darker than that of the red robin. And in regards to its passing, I have to say, I didn't care as much. That was uh, Robin's in passing. I think I'm only going to do about 10 poems before this video is up. Let's see, how much, how much do I got? I did Moonlight Vacancy, Morning Rain, Hate be a friend, fire treasure, the pass around, robins in passing. This next one I got free is the seventh one. It's called In Earnest. In Earnest, here we go. I think I'd be better off in one of those seaside communities. One where I could drink alone at night, oversleep, and then walk the beaches during the day. There I could linger like Hemingway, half alive and admiring the young girls in yellow bikinis while I sit back, becoming something made up of wrinkles and tobacco smoke. Something made up of age and guff, gruff, and contentment. There I could wear cargo shorts and Hawaiian shirts with thin white wife beaters underneath every day. There I could smoke discarding the fear of damaging lungs that were once young and now breathe confidently again. There I could kick back and call myself a man while I hid away from the world. There I could be who I wanted to be in my old age, single and worn, leathery and wise. Who knows if I'll ever find my place on the beach, or if I'll die trying to get there. That was my seventh poem of the book Beatnik, uh, in earnest. <laughs> this next poem is about unicorns, which you lot might like. Mm. See, what I like about the heavier drinks is when you put ice in them, sometimes the ice carries a little bit of the flavoring from the alcohol. So you get to crunch down. So it's like chewing, especially with this, it's like chewing whiskey. Mm. Chewing whiskey. There's an idea for a poem. There's an idea for a poem title. All right. Uh, what is this? Fucking 
Moonlight vacancy, morning rain, hippie friend, fire treasure, the pass around, Robinson passing, in earnest, roasted unicorn, here we go, the eighth, the eighth poem, roasted unicorn. Countless spec uh, uh, countless specimens, fuck me. Countless species, one vessel. The ark is light angelic wood being cradled on a world of open seas. Ninety-nine days ago we ran out of food. The lions have eaten the hippogriffs, and the crocodiles have devoured the phoenixes. I'm told they were spicy. As I pacify the other animals, the meat eaters and I have barbecues on deck at midnight. Roasted unicorn is fucking delicious. If we don't reach land, by tomorrow the squirrels are next on the menu. And that's why uh, unicorns don't exist anymore. Thanks, Noah! This next poem... Uh, it's a stupid poem. Roasted unicorn is a stupid poem. I don't know why anyone would... I don't know why the fuck I wrote that. I just, I'm like, wouldn't that be a funny idea? I think I, I think once I saw a fucking uh, a, a robot chicken skit where they were racist against mythical creatures or some shit. I don't know. Here we go. What are we on? We're on the ninth poem now. One more after this. The cabin. This is about a bar restaurant that I went to once that I really fucking hated. It's, uh, this poem's called The Cabin. Middle-aged men with blood-red faces and sky-high blood pressure belt out the oldies hard and loud. Ghouls, specters of a dead generation, linger in husks in a seizure mob on the floor. <laughs> this is horrible. They wiggle to the rapid strum of the electric guitar, tone-deaf and geriatric. <laughs> this is shit. Their ankles crack as they hop up and down, ignorant to the fact that this chapel of the blues was built to inspire their nostalgia. Quietly on the side of a highway road, their little shack rumbles, containing their desire to be who they once were. That time is gone and their song is ended. Now they fizzle like inflatable dummies in front of their car lots hoping that in their loose shake they can rediscover, relive, or rejoin the past. Give up. The future is now. That kind of sounded very elitist, didn't it? Eh. Alright, this last one. This is the tenth. And I hate to leave you guys on such a shit note. I'm going to try to do... I might make this a series. I might do ten, you know, ten poems... A thing. I really want to promote this book. Uh, ten poems a video. That sounds that sounds pretty fair. What do you guys think? Um, this next one's called Average Joe. It's about. I'm not going to say who it's about, but it's about somebody that I know. Um, after coming home, he had trouble adjusting. Boot camp was all he had known for months, believing it had been years. Before he had left. He had liked cars and played cops and robbers with his buddies on the playground. When he came back, he believed in capitalism and obsessed over collecting knives. He believed boot camp was life, and that anyone not living like him was living wrong. In the end, he convinced himself he was special and that it was the world that was crazy, not him. To question him was to question God and country. For he believed his time in camp granted him status as a soldier. Despite begging for an honorable discharge after eight weeks in the heat. If you see him in the mall, he still demands to be called a soldier. I really fucking slurred that last part. Soldier. Sorry. Sorry. Too much whiskey tonight. Too much. Mm. As his dumbass goes for another sip out of an empty fucking cup you know what i'll indulge this. i'll do one more an 11th an 11th poem for my first video of the poem reading here 
How do you like that? This next one is called Pickle Factory. This will be the last one, and then I got to skedaddle because this, this is going on 20 minutes here. Pickle Factory is the name of this next poem. I think there is a factory somewhere that mass produces bald men with thick glasses and dark gray sweaters that try to sell me the keys to self-improvement. I was made in a factory that manufactures plastic pickles. The kind from the German tradition of hiding pickles in the tree to be found by the children come morning. The factory is closed now. It was shut down after the landlord gave up drinking and I couldn't be bribed with California wine anymore. How the fuck I happened, I'll never know. It's weird. I feel like less is said in that poem than was meant to be said. Basically, if you don't know, there's this German tradition of hiding a pickle in a tree. And whoever finds the pickle gets a wish and gets to open their birthday presents first on Christmas morning. Um, I don't think I mentioned... I don't think I displayed that well enough in the poem. But I suppose people who know that will technically get the whole hiding the pickle in the tree phrase. Um, and that's it. My next poem is Asimov's Dead, but unfortunately that brings this poetry reading of mine to 11 poems in total, and I'm going to have to end it. I'm sorry, but um, I'll see y'all guys next time, and maybe at some point I'll be able to fucking publish the Beatneck, a collection of poetry by Brian Charles Alexander on Amazon at some point, and I'll be able to tag it or I'll send a tag to it or whatever, uh, a link to it in the description below. But uh, thank you all for joining me, and I will see you next time. Uh, keep writing.